Hey folks, welcome to today's video. And today we are going to be doing another edition of my makeup archives videos. And we've done, God, every year from like 2010 up through 2017. And today we're gonna be talking about 2018. I know, we're getting so close. We're getting so close to the now, to the now times, to the present times. And then soon we'll be in the future times. Ah. <laughs> So if you've never seen any of these videos before, basically I go through some archives. Most of the time it's Temtalia. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about 2018. So I have a bunch of images saved in my Google Drive um, because that's how we do this. <laughs> Fenty was kind of in full form that year. So many new products. I'll just talk about all of Fenty's right now. Fenty Fussy Gloss Bomb came out in 2018. And this I believe was the second of the gloss bombs, the Fenty Glow, I think that was it called the first one. I, I've never had a Fenty lip gloss, so I don't know. Um, but the Fussy Lip Gloss, as well as the Diamond Bomb Lip Gloss and the Diamond Bomb uh, Highlighter came out in 2018. And I actually bought that. It's kind of a weird texture. I will say it was this kind of silicone base pure glitter type highlighter. Granted, it looked very pretty in like video. It looked like wet skin. In person, it looked okay. It didn't look as good as on video, but like it was nice. It was definitely something that worked best on like no makeup makeup because putting it on top of powder was very weird. It was a weird texture weird, weird texture, but people lost their minds about that highlighter. They're like, oh my God, this is the wettest looking highlighter I've ever seen. It's pure glitter. Blah. People lost their minds. And then other Fenty stuff that came out that year. Ooh, the Moroccan Spice Palette came out in 2018 as well. I believe I anti-hauled this because it was pretty derivative of a lot of other palettes that were coming out like the year before, during that year where it was like warm neutrals with a pop of blue. It was a pretty palette. I wasn't a fan of the like diagonal pans, but that's just my own personal pet peeve. I'm annoying, I know. It was a pretty palette. I really liked the outside. The outside was really gorgeous, but it wasn't the most accurate to the inside because the inside was a little more like muted. Yeah, this came out in July of 2018. We're not going in any like chronological order this time. We're going through like the brands because I feel like it's gonna be much easier for me to edit and much easier for me to like keep my brain hinged, <laughs> you know? I think Fenty has just gotten like better and more streamlined as a brand as the years have gone by. I think when they first started, there was just kind of like a lot of everything. Granted, they had a really great start as a brand, like Fenty killed it like right out the gate, but they just kept getting more and more like streamlined and, and finding themselves. And it makes me really happy too, because the products are good. <laughs> but that was Fenty 2018. Um, Mac. There's a handful of stuff that came out in 2018. I think that was the last year I bought things from Mac. The Nematang lipstick, and it was the part of their Maker collection. And this was a deep, deep red in a matte finish. Ooh, I... See, if I was still buying from Mac, I would've bought this. This came out after I think I had stopped and it was so pretty. This was right also when Nima was getting really big and people were starting to pay attention to her as an influencer, which is awesome because I like love her content and I feel like she puts out consistently good content. This was really cool for her as well because this was relatively, I don't want to say early on in her career, but like right now where she's like skyrocketing doing full collections of Dose of Colors, like this was big, this was big for her and I remember people being really excited for it. For a while there, Mac was floundering as far as like collabs and collections and they weren't really doing very much. And I think they finally clued into like, oh, we need to actually like work with influencers. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, this was, it was pretty. It was definitely pretty. Oh, but then they also had the Aaliyah collection and <laughs> I'm not mad at the eyeshadow palette. I'm not mad at the lipstick. I'm not mad at the liner. Am I inspired by any of them? No, but the weirdest part of this whole little capsule collection with Aaliyah's estate, because Aaliyah has been dead for a long time, uh, is that they put out a bronzer that was like my shade of bronzer. I know it got some backlash back then, but I feel like if Mac did that now, people would be like, why? If you're, what? Why is this bronzer the, not dark enough to, what? I remember this Aaliyah collection not being well received. I remember people were like, what the heck is this bronzer? Huh? That's weird. The packaging was pretty, but uninspiring nonetheless. But then the last thing that we're gonna talk about from MAC, which I definitely bought something from, this was the Jeremy Scott collection. 
And I'm not gonna lie, I don't know much about Jeremy Scott. I know he was like a fashion designer and like very kind of edgy rock, bright colors type stuff. Like he's kind of a an edgy guy. And he put out a collection with Mac that was actually so cool. Like the whole design of it, was it the most practical as far as usability? Literally no. It was like a boombox eyeshadow palette and then like a cassette tape, little lip palette, and then a blush bronzer and highlight trio in like a CD. I bought the CD, I did. I bought it because I was like, I love this. This is so dorky. I will, if I don't use it, I will use it as display. I don't know where it is right now. I think I have it in a box. So clearly it's not being displayed anywhere. I wish I wouldn't have bought this because I like just am not gonna finish it and it's just kind of gonna sit there. I, I remember this was pretty, like this was a cool collection and it really hit the, uh, the 90s kids nostalgia because it was a boombox and a burned CD and a cassette tape. I thought it was really cool. It was just a poor use of space on the boom box, but it did look like sound level. So I guess it made sense, but otherwise it was just kind of a useless waste of space. So, so we're gone through Mac. Let's talk about Urban Decay because there's a handful. Urban Decay came out with the Naked Cherry palette. This I think was the palette that LS predicted and basically it was like, yeah, I think Urban Decay has a cherry palette coming out. Like that's the next one. And then they did. Like, I, I don't know where she found the information, but she found information about the Naked Cherry palette. And then they released the Naked Cherry palette and we were all like, Elle was right. Elle was right. <laughs> and honestly, it's pretty. <laughs> At the time I was like, there's so many warm neutrals. There, we don't need any more. And this again was when there were so many warm neutrals and now they're kind of cycling back but back in 2018 that's everything that brands were putting everything were like pinks reds oranges all of it and naked cherry didn't really have much cherry tones in there it could have used a little more red it was a little too berry and a little too peach for my liking but naked cherry was a time Ooh, and then they also had the elements collection for a holiday and this was actually kind of pretty not gonna lie it was a lot of jewel tones a lot of shimmers in a round container with lots of bright colors and stuff and honestly like this was I, I remember thinking this was pretty. I didn't buy it because I tend to not use palettes that are kind of odd shapes that are not square or rectangles. Um, personally, it's just easier for me to hold. And if I'm holding up the mirror, it's kind of hard to hold the mirror if the hinge, you know, it's just hands, it's easier that way. But this was pretty. And I feel like this was actually a pretty well received collection for the holiday, as far as I remember. And like, I looked at this, I'm like, I'm not mad at this. I wasn't mad at a lot of stuff that Urban Decay put out this year because they also had the Born to Run collection, which I almost bought. I did. I almost bought it and I was like, is this going to be the thing that brings me back to Urban Decay? Like this is actually kind of cute because it was the, the packaging was very nostalgic and simple and I, I thought it was different. It was cute. It didn't, it probably didn't take that much work to do the packaging. They probably just had a bunch of stock photos and stuff they were able to like piece together. So it's definitely not the most like revolutionary as far as like packaging art, but I thought it was cute. Honestly, this looked like a pretty good size palette for taking traveling with you. Granted, um, now we're not traveling anywhere, so I wouldn't have a need for it now, but maybe back in 2018, I would have, but I almost bought this. I remember looking at it inside uh, and I was like, oh, I like this. That's pretty. I like that a lot. And I think this one was also pretty well received. A lot of people were like, wow, Urban Decay actually put something out that makes sense. That's not over the top and ridiculous. What? <laughs> Who were they? Cause for a while, Urban Decay was just doing the most all the time for no reason. <laughs> but this was not one of them. This was pretty. One thing that they were doing that was too much was the Urban Decay and uh, Kristen Leanne collection. And this was the Kaleidoscope palette. I don't know much about Kristen Leanne other than some of the things that have popped up on Reddit forums about her over the years. I don't buy Arctic Fox hair dye anymore because of what I read about her. At the time, I didn't know anything about her. In 2018, I was like, who's this girl? She's got bright hair. Okay, cool. This palette, I saw this and I was like, this could have been so pretty. It really could have. If they had just put this in a, a layout that made sense. What was this? Nothing was the same. There were like three things that were the same size. And then they had a bunch of things that were different sizes, a split pan. The colors were all over the place. I was just like, 
baffled. And I anti-hauled this because of that, because I was like, there's no reason for this to be this out of sorts, and it's more expensive than it would be if they were putting it in a normal packaging, because they had to pay for the custom packaging extra. Ah, I hate this, and I still don't like it. I think they also put out like a blush trio face palette or something, but... Yeah, I was not a fan of this. I, I mean, like, some of the colors in here individually looked pretty, but I saw this in the store and I was like, wow, that's that's a choice. All right, let's go to Too Faced. Let's, let's speed through Too Faced because there's a handful. We have the Gingerbread Spice palette, which we have seen so many times since then. The Gingerbread Spice 2 palette, the Cinnamon Roll palette, some other spicy palette. I don't know. Too Faced holiday palettes always look the same. So... Um, I'm looking at this and I'm getting a little bit of... So yeah, this was so uninspiring. And I mean, at the time it was like, oh, that's kind of cute, but now we're like, boring. One thing that Too Faced did put out that year that I was so close, so close to buying. This is the only time I swear in the last like five years that I have been tempted by a Too Faced product. This was the Too Faced 20th anniversary collection that used the old Too Faced logo that was very like late 90s, just like so retro looking. Oh my gosh. And it was pink and sparkly and the colors in here looked really cool. They had like the old kind of formula colors and then the new formula colors. I almost bought this. I really did. And I would have bought it if it had not been for the fact that it was so giant. This was such a huge, unnecessarily large palette. I saw that in the store and I was like, well, I'm not going to buy it now because it was so much bigger than it needed to be. It was so big. And I, I this close to buying it because everything about the design, it was just like, oh my God, this is giving me Alex Mack goodness. I want it, but I didn't buy it. I guess there was only two. Oh no. Then there was the festival collection that had the highlighter sticks that looked very suggestive. I remember getting so mad at this collection and I was like, festivals, bleh. And like, I was just so annoyed with the fact that Too Faced was like capitalizing on festival and nobody's going to wear this much makeup to a festival because they're going to sweat it all off. And I was just like so high and mighty about like this is not what you're gonna wear to a festival. I was so mad. I anti hold this so viciously because I hated everything about it. Now, I don't really care as much. I'm, I'm a lot less like mad about things anymore um, because I've seen so much now that is so much more actually harmful besides like dorky festival makeup. Um, and that's what this was. It was dorky festival makeup and it was like unicorns and it was kind of all over the place. Not all festivals are like bright sparkly unicorns. Some are like gross and you're in the mud and it's like in the middle of summer and it's hot and then it rains and then you're stuck in a tent. Like to me, why I had such a bone to pick with it is that it's going to give like unrealistic expectations to people going to festivals thinking that they're actually going to use this much makeup and have it still look good by the end of the day when it's not. <laughs> like that, that was why I was mad about it, which is so stupid. Yeah, I was not a fan. Not a fan. I told you this was going to be a long video. We're only like halfway through. <laughs> We're only halfway through. I need to stretch. I need to refresh. Refresh my perfume. My perfume has come. Speaking of refreshing, today's video is sponsored by Scentbird. Hmm. The one I'm wearing today is Colette from Toka. Oh my gosh. It smells so nice. Ah! Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you choose from over 600 brands of perfumes to get a deluxe sample size, a 30 day supply of perfumes. And I really like it because I love perfumes. Um, if you've seen my perfume collection, it is a little bit one sided when it comes to brands. And I've always wanted to branch out more. And right now going into stores and sniffing perfumes isn't really that doable right now, because if you're going into stores, you're wearing masks and sniffing perfumes through masks. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do because the problem with perfume sample sizes that you get from packages that you get as like free samples, they're so small that you end up losing them and not actually getting any use out of them. So the size of the Scentbird ones are perfect because they're bigger. They have the cute little carrying case that comes with it. And then all you have to do is twist it up. This month I actually received Rebecca Minkoff blush, which is very lovely. It's very clean. Oh, I knew it was bergamot. Ooh, there's Tonka in here too. I also received Confessions of a Rebel, bitch please. This one is definitely much more my speed normally. Sweet, syrupy, um, kind of smoky in a way, but this actually has black currant in it, which is another favorite of mine too. 
It's black currant, sandalwood, jasmine. Mm, I'm a sucker for jasmine too. I love jasmine. Atelier Cologne, Clementine, California. The name fits it perfectly. It smells like citrus fruits in the summertime. Oh yeah, this one's, it's got juniper and vetiver too. Juniper, this, that's what's adding the tartness because juniper is actually used to make gin because I love gin. Rag and bone incense. Mm, this one's so good. I know why I like it. It's black pepper. Oh yeah, I can really pick up the black pepper here. Ooh, this is a fall fragrance and it's perfect because it's orange. <laughs> Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $16. Every month you actually get to pick what you want to receive so there's no surprises. Um, you know how sometimes subscription services are like, here's a mystery box of things. This one, you pick what you want. So you get exactly what you want. And they have perfumes and colognes and a ton of unisex options from over 600 brands to choose from, which is awesome. And if you're like me and you can't decide uh, on just one fragrance, you can upgrade to receive two to three a month. Scentbird carries top designer brands like Prada, Gucci, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Vince Camuto, The Harmonist, and Confessions of a Rebel, which I got one from this month. And thankfully, all of them are 100% authentic, so you don't have to worry about like bootleg fragrances. They do work directly with the brands. And if you aren't somebody who knows a lot about what kind of scents or notes you really like, you can take a quiz on Scentbird's website to get a better idea of what you like and they can kind of cater your choices. You get to pick that really expensive perfume for $16. And there's some, the Harmonist for $295, Sicily for $280. I'm not spending that much money on perfume. So having the smaller bottles are really great because I will use all of it and I get my money's worth. A regular Scentbird subscription is $16 a month for a pretty decent sized amount of high-end fragrance. But with my code archives30, that is archives30, you get 30% off. That's $11 instead of 16 for your first month subscription. So definitely use the code archives30 to get your first month 30% off at Scentbird. Now that I have thoroughly nerded out about um, fragrances, let's get back to the rest of the products. <laughs> ABH had a couple of releases that year. We had the Norvina, the original Norvina palette, which I bought and I still like, and I still stand by the fact that I like it. It had slightly different formulas to the older ABH palettes, but I like it still. Like it's the pink and purple one with the light purple um, fuzzy packaging. It was very simple. This I feel like was kind of the lighter precursor to the Jackie Ina palette. Like they actually go together quite well. If you have both of them, if you have both of them, just saying they go together well. I loved this palette. Like when I bought it and I was like, oh, this is one of my new favorites. Like this is all the colors that I want. And this is when I started doing the two-toned eye looks. This is what started me on the two-toned eye looks. Besides the fact that my hair was two-toned. Oh, the purple is so faded. I liked this palette. And then they also had the Soft Glam collection. Oh my gosh, the Soft Glam palette. This was their new capsule palette. Perfect for bridal makeup, perfect for everyday makeup, perfect for people who were too afraid of the, like bright reds and modern renaissance. This was, this was it in was it spring of 2018? I never bought this. This is one of the only ABH palettes I don't have because I was like, I have all these shades in Modern Renaissance and in the other one. And there are too many light shades that aren't gonna look that different on my face. And you know, I wasn't completely sold on it. Yeah, this was very popular. This is still probably one of ABH's most popular eyeshadow palettes for sure, because it's so, I mean, not, not basic in a bad way, but like basic isn't that, that it's like usable for a lot of people. It'd be nice if there was some more dark shades in here. Give me some more variety. But yeah, that was a bestseller for a long time. Um, Bite Beauty did their yearly Zodiac lipstick line. And I remember being so done dirty with the Gemini lipstick. Why? We're not trying to be Kim Possible every day. Why did you give the Geminis a two-tone lipstick? Yeah, like there were so many prettier lipsticks with the Zodiac collection that when the Gemini one came out, I'm like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> I, who asked for this? And then what's next? What's next? What's next? ColourPop. We only have one ColourPop collection in here because that's, this is all that I remember that was of use and of, of 
note. They did one of their first Disney collections, and this was their Disney and ColourPop designer collection. And I remember this being so boring. <laughs> like, this is what they were doing with Disney when they started. It was just like, kind of like pastel, super shock shades, and then like a boring neutrals palette that has like signatures from Disney princesses. Eh? I know I'm not a Disney adult and like somebody who's super into Disney, so I know that I'm not the target demographic for anything Disney. I don't care. But this, was, I just remember being so just bored. Okay, I do want to talk briefly about the debacle that was the Huda Beauty relaunch of her rose gold. Yeah, the rose gold palette. This was a debacle. Huda Beauty had a previous iteration of this palette that she discontinued. And this was, I don't remember when it was discontinued. It might've been 2017, it might've been 2016, I don't know. And was like, oh, it's never coming back. Essentially telling people that if they wanted it, they should go out and buy it now. Little did everybody know that they were gonna be reformulating it and re-releasing the palette, which was very shady because then the people who liked the color story and liked the color selection were tempted to go out and buy the new one. Granted, people make their own choices and they don't have to go out and buy the new one. If you're telling people that a palette isn't coming back at all, they're gonna be more inclined to buy it then than if you had said, oh, we're taking this one off the shelves, we're coming back with a new and better formula, then people would have waited. So this was this was something that was part of like beauty news at the time. People were like, oh my gosh, like Huda Beauty is like shady. Ah, like this was, this was one of the few kind of like bigger scandals I feel like with the brand early on was this because they were not really transparent about the fact that they were reformulating it. And that's totally valid criticism. Cause I was like, I would be mad if I went out and bought a palette thinking that it wasn't gonna come back. And then like a year later, it was like, psych, we made it better. Like what, <laughs> why? Um, let's talk a little bit about Makeup Revolution. And Makeup Revolution back then was much smaller than they are now. I feel like they were not pumping out products as quickly as they are now. And I feel like they had a lot more products that were, I mean, I think they still have a pretty balanced kind of releases that are more dupable or like dupe palettes and then things that are more like their own formula and their own creations. I do remember their highlighters being very good. But one of the biggest makeup things that happened in 2018, Emily Noel came out with a collection, uh, two palettes with Makeup Revolution. And there was the Wants and the Needs palette. And I remember the Wants or the Needs palette being a little, it looked a little cheap to me with like the size of the pans and the shapes of the pans. But I was never like a big watcher of Emily Noel. I have nothing against her. Her stuff was just never my style of thing. So I never really gravitated towards her content. But uh, I remember thinking the palette are actually quite pretty. The wants, I almost bought. <laughs> like I almost bought the Watts palette. The needs, I had, could take it or leave it because it was stuff that I already had. So this was definitely something that was more for beginners and people who were just starting their makeup collection, which for Emily's channel was a really good idea because she was all about technique and about like kind of the basics, did a lot of drugstore, a lot more affordable products. And a lot of people learned a lot of things from Emily over the years. So putting out a more kind of capsule, simple, collection made a lot of sense for her. And then the Needs palette, this I almost bought. This was super pretty. It was like purples and greens and mauves. Like this was actually like, I was this close to buying it. But then when I got it in the store, like when I saw it in the store, I'm like, ah, that's a little too big for me. Like I'm not actually gonna use this because this still is pretty large because people were so excited for Emily because she'd been making content for so long and had never done a collab. People were really excited and there was some shenaniganry that went down when Tati did a, a review of it. And it was um, a little more negative than it needed to be. There was just a lot of stuff that was kind of off about the video. And then there was like drama around it. Like other people were making content being like, no, this is wrong. And it was just, it was kind of a mess for a while, but this collection, it made a lot of sense for her and it was really well done. So it was very cool for her, for sure. And then last but not least, we have Tarte. We have Tarte, Tarte makeup. Um, um, Tarte uh, put out some stuff in 2018. They put out the Tarte Tardis Pro Remix Amazonian Clay Palette. And this one I heard was not good. <laughs> I heard from reviews that it was not good, uh, that the original Tardis Pro was good, but the Pro Remix 
not good. I do remember seeing it on shelves. I'm like, why is there like spackled paint behind? Like, why why does the background look like that? Why is the background brighter than the eyeshadows? That's one of my big pet peeves about makeup palettes is when the actual like pattern or like the, the packaging itself on the inside is brighter than the colors. Like it just makes the colors look so much more muted, which is why I love like gray, black, even pink, like something like a light, like a muted pink or like a deep pink, something that like matches, but it's not brighter. I don't know. And I also hate super busy patterns for the background of eyeshadow palettes. So this ticked both of those boxes. Um, it's not a bad looking palette, but I remember hearing it didn't perform well. So this was Tarte's attempt at something bright. All right. Um, but earlier in the year, they had put out one of the silliest named palettes I've ever seen. It was called Be a Mermaid and Make Waves. What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> what? Be, be a, something about the way that Tarte names their palettes. This is gonna be a very niche reference. You know how sometimes when you're scrolling through anime streaming services and you're reading the titles to some of the shows in English and you just kind of look at it confused and think the title has got to sound way cooler in Japanese. And then when you see what the title is in Japanese, you're like, yes, it sounds way cooler. Why don't they just have it in Japanese? It sounds ridiculous in English. That's what their titles of their palettes remind me of, that it was written in a different language and sounds way cooler in that other language. And then they translate translated it to English and it sounds stupid as heck. <laughs> That's my take. Um, and this was one of them, Be a Mermaid and Make Waves. And I know it was just a pun, but it was so weird. The packaging itself was kind of cute, like that kind of faux leatherized outside that looked like a shell. The pans were kind of different shapes. Not the most exciting thing. This was a very similar color story to the Moroccan Spice palette that uh, Fenty put out, which again goes to show you that like so many of these brands will just like put out very similar color stories and like come up with different themes that like kind of work. Um, so the fact that it's something that was Moroccan Spice and also mermaid themed could have a very similar color story shows how creative brands are getting or they were back then. This was definitely not the worst offense that um, Tarte committed that year because Tarte released the Shape Tape Foundation in 2018. And let me tell you, um, I have not seen a worse like mainstream brand release response. The number of shades and the shade range of the initial launch of the Shape Tape Foundation was so very bad. And then their excuse was that this is everyone's winter shades and that we're gonna come out with more shades for when people get tan in the summer. Who? For, for who to get tan in the summer? Because there were definitely not even winter shades for many people in that initial launch. And there were clearly not enough shades to, um, to cut it because this was a year, like a year after Fenty really like got big and came out swinging with 40 shades of foundation on the initial launch, like a brand new brand. Tarte has been around for a long time. For their next hero product for the Shape Tape line, they came out with an abysmal foundation line. Mm -mm. And people ripped them to shreds. Shreds, I tell you. When Tarte release that foundation, that's all people were talking about. And I think this was kind of, I don't know if this is the first time, but it was like the biggest time where a brand really got what was coming to them as far as criticism for shade ranges. This was, I mean, it was unfortunate for Tarte, but probably not because they probably still had a lot of people buy things because their name was getting out there. But it was definitely a step in the right direction like after the fact, because people saw how much Tarte was ripped up and brands were like, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to like actually put like work into these shades and actually have some shades for people. Wow. So a lot of brands I think took notice and uh, decided to change it up a little bit and expand their shade ranges, which is a good thing. Yeah. That's everything I wanted to talk about in today's makeup archives. I realized it was a lot it was a lot. I mean, there were a lot of products that came out that year and that this isn't even close to everything. No, if I did everything, if I did a whole video about every product that came out, it would be at least two and a half hours long. Let me know in the comments down below if you remember any of these products, if you still have them, if you bought them, if you anti-hauled them, what your thoughts on them are. For today's song of the day, it is... Let's go back to some anime theme or anime soundtrack because I want to. Um, so today's song of the day is off the Jujutsu Kaisen soundtrack because 
I'm predictable, but it is the self embodiment of perfection, which was the kind of score part when Mahito was doing his like domain expansion with all the hands and stuff. But this is also a really cool song. <laughs> but yeah, self embodiment of perfection from the Jujutsu Kaisen soundtrack is your song of the day. If you would like to see more of me, subscribe. Uh, hit the bell notification to get notified when I upload new things. It's usually Tuesdays and Fridays. And then I stream on Twitch on Saturdays. Uh, my social media are Instagram and Twitter are abers 7 and Twitch is Abers without the 7 Thank you again, Scentbird, for sponsoring today's video. Definitely check out the links below. Um, it's very helpful. You can try out any of the perfumes that I showed in this video. Have a good rest of your week, y'all. It's Friday. You made it to the end of the week. Congratulations. I hope you get some sleep. I hope you have a good weekend, stay hydrated, and I will see you all in my next video. Bye.